Welcome again. We're so glad that you are here. Uh, Today, we continue forward in week two of a series that we've entitled Poured Out. Now, this is a Lent series, and and essentially what this whole series does is it explores our need to confess our sin, to fully trust in God's faithfulness to forgive. And so week in and week out, we go to God, we bear our grief, our sin, our, our pain and brokenness. We hold nothing back, and in return, God holds nothing back. He pours out himself for our redemption. And so it's it's a really great series. It leads us up to Easter, which is God's ultimate pouring of himself out with his death on the cross and his resurrection from the grave. And so it's a it's an exciting time, an exciting series. And today's message I have entitled as five certain steps. Five certain steps. And so if you've got your Bibles, I invite you to open up. We'll be in Psalm 27 today. And so you can turn there. Um, If you don't have your Bibles with you, there's Bibles in the pew that you can use. You can even take that home if you don't have one. Um, And if you're online, the words will be on the screen as well. Um, So I, I would extend this title a little bit if I wanted to, to five certain steps in uncertain times. Because I, I feel like we can all agree it feels like we're in uncertain times right now. Whether it be the pandemic, whether it be the threat of war, it, it, we are in uncertain times. And so I think having certain steps from God's word are what, what we really need today. And so with all of that, with everything that's going on, crisis and when crisis happens, anxiety kind of comes. And, and whenever it's an international crisis, a global crisis, anxiety heightens even more. And so from the pandemic to the tensions between Ukraine and Russia and the rest of the world, our life is not quite the same as it used to be a little bit ago. We may say that times are changing. We may be a little fearful. And, and as I was doing some, some study for this, most therapists right now are really every single meeting that they have, all that they are doing is trying to help people cope because we're under a lot of stress and anxiety and pressures right now that perhaps we've been through before, but it it feels like it's been some time since we've walked through these things. And so there's a lot of coping going on. You can find that on Google. You can download apps that help you with like coping and meditation, all these things. You can go to TV shows and see this. And so this is a big issue. Fear is natural. Let me say this to just start it all off. Fear is natural. It's a normal thing for us to be fearful. But we're not called to natural living. We're not. We're called to supernatural living through the help of the Holy Spirit. We're called to a higher plane of existence, supernatural living. And and we can and should deal with our struggles, our pains, our anxieties and things. I'm a complete proponent of therapy, of counseling. I have been to it and been through it. And so I completely endorse it. I I think that's necessary and should happen. I think everybody needs counseling. And and so I'm not saying don't do that, but I'm saying we can go through this, uh, this process of, of addressing these things, and then we can move beyond it. And that's okay. That, and what we do to, to go to supernatural living, the way that we find that help is to go to the scriptures. And, and baby's all right. It's all good. I'm, I'm happy to hear baby cry, so let, let's, let's draw back in. So um, it's okay It's okay for us to be afraid, but it's okay also. We need to move towards supernatural living, and that's found in the scriptures. And so we go to the Psalms today. We're in Psalm 27, and the Psalms are a great place to go. We love to go to the Psalms because no matter who it is, whether it's David that wrote it, the sons of Korah, Asaph, it doesn't matter. When we go to the Psalms, oftentimes we walk away saying, wow, I was feeling very similar to that. Or maybe I'm walking through something like that. And so these psalms, it feels like it's speaking to us with what we're going through. It's personal in a way. Psalm 27 has a lot to share with where we're at right now. See, it's written during a time of national crisis, Psalm 27 is. And we know that by the words that are used in this psalm. So you will see all sorts of different words that speak to a national crisis that is going on. But you'll also see that it's a person walking through personal crisis. 
And the person that we're going to read this psalm who has written it um, is David. David is the author of this. Now, that's where things get a little dicey, right? Because David is a man of crisis. I mean, it doesn't matter if it was his family who hated him, if it was he was hunted down by Saul, he was chased down by Goliath, he was attacked by the Philistines. In his time, in, in his kingship, there was multiple crises that happened. His, his, even his son, Absalom, tried to come and commandeer the throne to take it from him. And so you take your pick. I mean, we don't know exactly what crisis David was walking through, but he was walking through one personally as well as the nation was walking through one together too and so we know that through words that are in the psalm the words like uh, wicked enemies foes the army false witnesses breathing out threats of violence and so there's some sort of warfare that's going on as david is writing this song and and so he's writing what's going on in his life and I don't know if, as I have said those words, if it struck you like it struck me as I was reading this song, those words very much describe how what we're walking through, whether it be in the past two years or even right now presently with this, with this time of warfare, that we've been using words like we've been battling with COVID. We, we've been fighting this enemy that's unseen, that is COVID. Uh, we've been using words like war and threats of violence and enemies with all of this has been bombarding us left and right with the news of, of, of the invasion from the Russians. And so Psalm 27 has a lot to say and a lot to do with what we're walking through right now. All of that to say that. But here's the great news. It has other words, too. It has words like strength confidence beauty sing salvation and goodness and so what psalm 27 really is all about it's for us as believers it's what we are to be marked by in times of crisis psalm 27 is what we as believers are to be marked by in times of crisis and so in uncertain times i pray that god through his word will show us five certain steps to take in the midst of uncertainty and the first step is the step of vigilance, the step of vigilance. And so if you'll, if you'll open your Bibles, we'll be in verses 2 and 3. I just want to show you a quick snapshot of them, little phrases in it. So David says, when the wicked advance against me to devour me, and, and he's, he's writing this in real time, it seems. It, you'll go to verse 3. It says, though an army besiege me. And I show you these pictures here because David is not ignorant of what's going on around him. He's, he's writing exactly what's happening, that the wicked are advancing against him to devour him. That army is trying to besiege him. He's, he's quite aware of what's going on. He's not ignorant to the fact that the world is wicked and that these enemies are coming after him. David wrote about these things. Similarly, you and me, we're, we're not naive to the things that are happening around us. We, it's not that we have a lack of information. I would argue we have an, an abundance of information, an overload of information coming at us at all angles. To be honest, I think we, would, we might say that we've become amateur experts on all things just by watching the news consistently. We talk about COVID-19 infection rates as if we're Fauci. We talk about the effectiveness of vaccines as if we're doctors. We, we talk about the historical hate between Russia and Ukraine as if we have a PhD in studying these folks for some time. And, and we have all this information and it's an overload. And we have to be careful where we're getting our sources and things. We have to be aware of our dangers, but we, we don't need to let them overwhelm us. And I want to drill down on that just for a moment. Because for you in this room, for you online that are watching, being hyper aware of everything all the time, like we are in our culture, it has some nasty byproducts. Especially for people of faith, it's made a lot of people be shaken to the core. It has. You, you might say, you know, I'm aware of everything that's going on, but you know what else I'm aware of? Is that God's not doing anything about it. And so the question comes up, the big question that's on everybody's mind, that comes up every time something happens that's out of our control, is how can a good and loving God allow evil like this to happen? It's the question that comes up every time. It's the question that came up on September 11, 2001. 
It's the question that came up at World War II as you stood before Nazi concentration camps. You asked, how can God allow this evil to happen? And so some people conclude there's no God. There must be no God. Because if there is, well then where is he? Is the questions that we begin to hear, not only from people, but sometimes we struggle with these questions. And so here's the answer to it. Where is God? He's right in the middle of it. He's right in the middle of it. Not only does he see it coming, did he see it coming, not only can he control it, can he end it, but God is in the middle of it. And you might say, well, Cody, what in the world does that, what does that mean? How does that help? This is how it helps. Christianity is founded upon, the, it's built upon the life of a man who suffered and died. It, it's built upon the fact that Jesus took on flesh and whatever extreme thing that a human can go through, whether it be pain, suffering, humiliation, of murder, I mean being killed, he's walked through it. He's been through it. He knows it. And so it's not that he's not sympathetic or empathetic or understands what we're walking through, but that he, that he does. He sweat drops of blood. He was, he was anxious. Jesus wept whenever Lazarus died. He, he understands where we're at, how we hurt. See, we live in a fallen world. The Bible is clear about that. From the fall of man, sin entered, violence entered, corruption entered, pain entered, death entered. And that's, that's humanity there. Not only that, it goes further. There was a curse placed on man, but there was a curse placed on the earth. And so we know that there's earthquakes and lightnings that cause fire, damaging winds and damaging floods. That's a part of the biblical history as well as history right now. And so Christians aren't naive to this. We're quite aware. We don't turn a blind eye to the, to the way that this world is broken. We know what Jesus said, that God, has, God causes the sun and the rain to fall on the just and the unjust alike. We know what Job said. Job, who suffered horribly, lost his children and his, his entire financial situation, started to lose his, his, his uh, health by getting these boils and things on his skin. He said this, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. So any thinking Christian isn't naive to what is going on. Any thinking Christian is, knows that God does not automatically immune us from every tragedy, does not heal us from every single disease. Chuck Colson, he, he said this a few years ago. I thought it was an incredible quote. It's the, the next one up here. He says, it's, it is absurd for Christians to expect a miraculous answer for every need, from curing ingrown toenails to finding parking places. This only leads to faith in miracles instead of faith in God. I thought that was a powerful quote. It was a challenge. Uh, I mean, the question is, does God calm storms? Is, is God still here? Is he, is, is he there? Brother or sister, hear the words. Yes. God still calms storms. He does. He does. But oftentimes, he calms them as he comes into the storm with us. He calms us. He calms the storm in you and in me. We see that Jesus calms the storm in the scriptures. We have examples of how God has calmed storms in our own lives, but oftentimes he comes in the midst of them and he's there with us. And I'm praying that for you and for me as we're walking through it, as we're struggling through these storms of life, that we would stay strong in our faith to hold, hold firm to Christ who is our calm and is our peace and that we would hold tight to him in the midst of these storms. The biblical perspective, the step of confidence, the certain step for us is vigilance. We need to be aware of what's going on, but also be aware that one day, one day, this will be no more. One day this evil will not exist any longer. There will be healing. There will be no more hurt, no more pain, no more death. Be vigilant for that day too. Keep your eyes centered, brother or sister. Hold firm. The second step is... The step of confidence. The step of confidence. Watch what David does here. Going back to verse 1 and then into verse 3. David writes, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is my stronghold of, the stronghold of my life. Whom shall I be afraid? 
And then in verse 3, he says, Though an army besiege me, my heart will not fear. Though war break out against me, even then I will be confident. You see, in the same verse, there's fear and there's confidence. There's fear and there's confidence. That he is, uh, he is fearful, but he's not going to be completely afraid because he's confident in his Lord. Now, fear, again, is a typical emotion in crisis. We're walking through crisis right now. Fear is natural. That's why many soldiers are, are trained to harness it. That's why many EMTs and doctors and police officers and firefighters, they're, they're trained to harness this fear and channel it towards productivity and getting the job done. And, and David does the same thing here, but in a theological way. See, he says that like, I'm going to think through the implications of this all-powerful, sovereign God, yet living in a world that is marred by sin with evil. And so it's like David is saying, the Lord is my light. He's my light and my salvation. I'm not going to fear. In other words, if the Bible speaks of God the way that it does, if God is who he says he is, then I ought to be more fearful of God than of the circumstances that are around me. And that's exactly what Jesus said, right? Matthew 10, 28, he said, Do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy the body and soul in hell. Like Jesus said that. And so if there's anything that we should fear here, it's what is God going to do with my life and what am I going to do with God? Like we ought to think of that question. I love how David describes the Lord as his light. I love that, that word, that choice of depict, depicting God in this way. The Lord is my life. Because we all know this, the darkness accentuates our fears. Am I right? You remember when you're a kid, kids that are here listening, y'all, y'all know what I'm talking about. The darkness has a little bit of the scaries. And oftentimes the what ifs come out in the darkness. Our brain gets wonky and starts thinking of things strange. And so we get scared in the dark. But David describes the Lord as my light and my salvation. This point is a step of confidence. When you're in the dark, you're scared to take the next step. You don't know what you're going to step on. You don't know if, you're, if, if your step is sure. But the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? I can take that next step confidently. Maybe you don't know what your next step is and you feel like you're in the dark. Maybe you're just sitting there right now and you feel like you're in the dark and you're wondering where in the world is God? God sees you. He is your light and your salvation. And the beautiful thing about light that David accentuates is that where there's darkness and light shines in, that darkness is eradicated. Light is shown in. So so walk confidently, friends. Stand firm in that way and be able to take that next step because He is your light. He is your salvation. There's no need to fear. The first step was vigilance. The second step was confidence. The third step is the step of reverence. So we need to pause after realizing who God is to worship Him. And David writes about this in verses 4 through 7. He says this, One thing I ask from the Lord, this only do I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze on the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. For in the day of trouble he will keep me safe in his dwelling. He will hide me in the shelter of his sacred tent and set me high upon a rock. Then my head will be exalted above, uh, above the enemies who surround me. At his sacred tent, I will sacrifice with shouts of joy. I will sing and make music to the Lord. Hear my voice when I call, Lord. Be merciful to me and answer me. Here's what I love about the way that David crafts this song, specifically in these verses. It's as if David is saying this. When trouble overwhelms me, I'm going to let God overwhelm my trouble. I I love how he does this. In the midst of everything that's going on, remember, he he shared what's going on around him. He's being besieged by his enemies. They're creeping in. And what does he say but that he desires that he would be with the Lord, that he would see his face, that he would sing songs of joy to him, shouts of acclamation like, 
in the midst of his troubles, he wants God to just overwhelm them. He's like, I'm going to be so near to God in my worship with him that I'm going to be so overwhelmed with God that my troubles, they disappear. Like, think of Job. I'll go back to him. I mentioned him earlier. You all have heard the story of Job, perhaps. He was uh, described as a blameless and upright man of God. And, and so he's there, and, and all of these troubles begin to hit him. He, he loses his children. He loses his home. He loses his livestock, his income. He starts to lose his own health and everything. And, and his wife, overwhelmed by the troubles that were around her, her response is this. Curse God and die. Just, just curse him and die already. Like that's her response. The troubles overwhelmed her. And Job's response, being overwhelmed with God, the scriptures say that he fell to his knees that he worshiped God. We have the same choice today. We have, we have this idea, you know, tri trials have a tendency of drawing us closer to God or further from God. And we have that same choice there. Many years ago, there was a similar uh, global crisis happening. It was World War II. And the Nazis were bombing London. And there was a church that had a sign out front that said, if your knees get to knocking, and fall on them. If your knees get the knocking, fall on them. In the midst of the trouble, will we be overwhelmed by the God who overwhelms our trouble? And so I, I love that, that word there. I, will we be moved to prayer like David was? Will we be moved to worship like David was? I mean, the, his response is the one thing, the one thing I ask from the Lord. This only do I seek. And I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. Look at how emphatic David is. Like this, this is it. Amidst all the things, all the other things that could take my, my distraction away, all this trouble that's hitting in my life, the one thing that I want is to seek the Lord. The one thing that I want is to be with Him. It's this passion of pursuing God. In the midst of all that's happening right now in our world, I think that we can get overwhelmed by our troubles. But I think one truth that we've been learning from, from both COVID and this threat of war is that life is unpredictable. And it, with the unpredictability of life, we, we need to be prepared for what's coming. David was in this unpredictable you know, time in his life. It, it was war going on. He was in so much trouble. And what did he do? He went to the Lord. He prepared for this trouble by going to God, spending time with God. And so might we be people who take that step of reverence, of going to God, of holding firm to God. So we have vigilance and confidence, reverence. The next step, the certain step, is the step of obedience. There's no excuse for not obeying God. He, he gives us the truth, the way that we should go. And he asks that we not depart from it, but we struggle. <laughs> the step of obedience, though, is what God would call us to. Look with me at verse 8 of the song. He says, My heart says of you, seek his face. Your face, Lord, I will seek. See how quick that was. And God says, seek my face. He says, your, your face, Lord, I seek immediately. Like, that's what I do. I love that response. That obedience is right there. And look with me what he prays in verse 11. Teach me your way, Lord. Lead me in a straight, straight path because of my oppressors. I was curious as I was reading this psalm, um, and, and specifically reading these verses, did, did God like audibly speak to David to where he like heard, seek my face? Or perhaps was it the circumstances that were going on around him? The visceral language used by his enemies who were trying to put him down, this, this, all this trouble that was, he was facing all around him, was it in the midst of the chaos that the still small voice of God was nudging him to seek his face? Personally, I, I read it that way. I think that David heard God's voice through the troubles. Through the troubles. I think that this crisis, David would say, amplified God's voice better than he had ever heard it before. And I think that that's what happens in our lives. C.S. Lewis has this quote. It's a famous quote. You've probably heard it before. It says, God whispers to us in our pleasures. He shouts to us in our pain. Pain is God's megaphone to rouse a deaf world. 
I thought that was a, that's a powerful quote, beautiful quote. And it's C.S. Lewis. He, it, not much that he does that isn't pretty, pretty great. And so this, this, this quote was really, it, it spoke to me. And I think it's, it's what David is going through too. This, this trouble that he was walking through was a megaphone to hear God saying, seek my face. And so what has God been shouting to us in the midst of our troubles? What has God been saying to us? I think there's a few things. The first, I think, that God's been really speaking to us is that the brevity of life, the, the fact that we all will die. As death tolls have risen and stuff from COVID, as we've seen innocent lives being taken on our television screens and phones and stuff of this war going on there in Ukraine, we know that life is brief. And we know that we're not promised tomorrow. And so I think that this is something that we have been hearing louder, louder than ever right now. I think another thing that God has been shouting perhaps is our misplaced priorities. Is, is really our misplaced priorities. We, we focus on so many other things but God. We focus on so many other things that aren't necessary. And, and it, I mean, we bragged about our economy. We bragged about our strength and all this stuff. And then COVID came, we were knocked to our knees. And, and then this, all of this is happening. We've been knocked to our knees. Like, we have misplaced, we have misplaced priorities. The third thing is that God may be shouting the reality of heaven and hell. I think people have not really considered this very much too often. We, we kind of neglect it. But I think that this reality has been kind of brought to the forefront of our lives even more than ever today. And so maybe, maybe it is that you are not right with God. Maybe it is that you haven't received Christ as your Lord and your Savior. We need to be ready. <laughs> we need to be ready for that. And so you might hear God shouting today, seek my face, seek my face. And I pray, I, I, I beg of you that the Holy Spirit will be working and that you could respond like David, that all of us could respond like David, myself included, and say, your face, Lord, I seek but we obediently do that. I think that's the step of obedience we need to take. So we have vigilance, confidence, reverence, obedience, and the final step. The, the final step is of expectance. Now, in verse 13, David writes this, and this is the NLT. If you've been following along in the NIV, it may read a little different. I liked how the NLT had this first phrase here. This is a verse to remember, folks. Put to memory and hold it in your heart. It's a beautiful verse. I would have lost heart unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. I would have lost heart unless, and here's why I won't lose heart, because I believed, I, I expected that I would see the goodness of God in the land of the living. Again, I come to that verse as I'm reading it, and I'm curious, did David write this to himself, or did he write this to the audience for us to hear? I, I think that he wrote it to himself. He's reminding himself. I think you and I need to hear this verse more often than we think. I remember my poppy, my grandpa, used to say that he talked to himself because he liked to hear a wise person speak. <laughs> and, and I always thought that was a clever statement, and I, and I, I loved him for it. And, um, and I think David, in this psalm, and in many other psalms, speaks to himself, reminds himself of this truth, this wisdom here. That's my expectation. Not only am I noticing what's going on around me, not only am I trusting in the Lord, but I'm expecting God to do something through this. I'm expecting good things to come. I'm expecting that I have a future beyond today. So there's this expectation here that we ought to be able to take, this step of expectance. And so let me ask you this. Have you trusted this time to him? Have you trusted what's going on right now? This is a historic time that we're walking through, friends. Like This is a time that our grandkids and great-grandkids are going to look back in history books and be like, Hey, Grandpa, did you live in 2020? And I'll be like, Yep, Sonny, I sure did. <laughs> Let me tell you all about it. It was a troublesome time. And like you just start to talk about it. Like This is a time, like seriously though, this is a historic time that we're walking through. It's a, it's a time of, of stress and trouble. Something that people will talk about for years and years to come. Is your expectation from God? Or is it from something else in this world? 
Is, are you expecting something to happen through this? Something for your good? Something for our good? Do you expect to see God's goodness displayed even amidst this chaos? I hope that you do. I pray that you do. And so here's my challenge. Here's our homework today as we come to a close. Take this psalm, take Psalm 27, and pray it. Pray those five points. Not only this weekend, but throughout this week. Let this be our corporate common prayer. So go to Psalm 27 to see these five points and to pray them. Pray these five aspects with your life group as you meet this week. Pray these five aspects as you speak with your Sunday school that you might have, you know, parted from today, but you can still talk to them throughout the week. Pray this, these five aspects as you call up your family and pray them in your own words and give God the glory there. And so as a, as a recap, we've talked about a lot this morning. I just want to kind of bring it all to a close right here and, and offer an opportunity for us to trust in God if we have not. The first thing that I want to go back to is that we need to know that there is a God who cares for you passionately. Passionately. So much so that he went and, and laid his life down for us. It says that Christ was tempted in every way, yet was without sin. He can empathize and sympathize with you. He, he sweat droplets of blood as he was praying over the fact that he would be going to the cross for us. He, he wept whenever Lazarus died. He, it's, he understands. God understands where you're at. And so he, he knows that. He knows what you're walking through personally. Persevere today. Second, they persevere. It, this isn't going to be over in a week. This isn't going to be over in a, in a month. This might not be over in a year. I don't know when all of this is going to end. But perseverance and prayer is better than panic. And so persevere. Pray. Go to the Lord. Hold on. This won't last forever. Be your best self through the help of the Holy Spirit to live supernaturally when naturally you want to respond in all these other ways. Ask the Spirit to help you to live supernaturally right now, to be that light and that help. And then thirdly, just consider, consider the claims of Christ today. Consider them. Christ said that I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but by me. He said, I am the gate through which you should enter. There, he made exclusive claims as to who he was, and he proved it with his life, his death, and his resurrection, that we might have life and be raised to life with him. Would we trust that? The only certainty we have is that we are going to die, is that life will end. So have we come to grips with our mortality? Have we given our life to Jesus? And if you haven't, today is the day. Today is the day. You can do that today. And so if you've never done that, I, I usually don't do this, but I want to I lead us in a, in a prayer, in a, in a prayer that you can pray. You can say along with me in your head and your heart. You can say it out loud. And if you're watching online or here in the room, you have the opportunity today to accept Christ as your Lord and your Savior and begin living today with that expectance and that confidence to have sure steps in uncertain times. And so let me pray this. Lord, I know that I'm a sinner. Please forgive me. I believe that you sent Jesus into this broken world for me, to die for me, to raise again on the third day. I, I turn from my sin. God, I repent. I, I, I want to leave it behind. I, I turn to Jesus as my Lord and my Savior. I want to follow him. I want your peace, God. I want to experience your love. I want to experience your joy even now amidst all of this that's going on. So I give you my life. I make Jesus my Lord, my Savior, the King of my life. And I want you to help me follow you today and every day for the rest of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. And if you prayed that prayer, brother or sister today, if that's what you prayed in your heart, you accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior, it says that angels are rejoicing. God, I am rejoicing. I'm so excited for you. I want, to, I want to help you with your next steps. If that's something that you prayed today, you want to talk more about that, I, I'm right here. I'll be up front. I'll, be the, I'll probably be the last person here at the church to lock things up. I, I will be online via email or anything. You can email me there, folks. I want you to know that we want to help you along your journey with Jesus, give you resources, next steps, 
and we want to celebrate and welcome you into the family because you're no longer alone, but you're a part of the family of God, and I'm excited that you're here. And so I want to say a, a quick prayer as we then transition into our close of service today. We're going to sing two songs, a, a hymn and then a, a Lakin's last song before she goes on her leave or whatnot. Of, she has two more weeks till she gives birth, and so she's going to have to quarantine now. So um, we're going to sing that last song together. And I'm excited to, to just continue to let the Spirit move. Would you respond? as God would have you to respond. To help, ask God to help you have certainty amidst these uncertain times. Let me pray. God, thank you for this day. Lord, I'm grateful for the opportunity to have shared this word. Um, God, I just ask that you would help us to be certain in uncertain times. God, you are so good, so greatly to be praised. Holy Spirit, would you continue to move now? We invite you, and we're excited to see you. We pray this in your name. Amen.